In this video lecture, we're going to be learning about the neurophysiology of traumatic stress. We're going to look at some key terminology that uh, I think will be of interest to you because it plays a large role in your work as a counselor. It's important to understand the workings of the autonomic nervous system with many clients, particularly those who have gone through traumatic experiences. So we'll learn about the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. We'll learn about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis and its role in releasing adrenaline and cortisol as well as the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis. Then we'll learn about allostasis and allostatic load and what happens when the system is placed under too much stress. Then we'll learn about polyvagal theory. We'll spend a little bit more time on that this week, as well as cortisol and the typical trajectories of cortisol production and what happens in trauma. And then we'll turn our attention to the neuroscience of post-traumatic stress, what happens in the brain uh, during uh, when a person experiences post-traumatic stress. So as uh, you know, compared with last week, where we talked about the role of chronic stress, this week, we're looking at the role of traumatic stress, which is a slightly different concept that we'll be talking about in class. So let's look at traumatic stress and its impact. We'll be talking about the central nervous system and its impact. We'll also be talking about the peripheral nervous system and especially the autonomic nervous system related to the peripheral nervous system and the way in which the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches work together to help preserve your survival and keep you alive. Then we'll learn about the so, uh, kind of return our attention to the subcortex and limbic system and its role in trauma response such as threat detection of the amygdala, the role of the hippocampus in it, and memory, um, and also the role of the hypothalamus of course in sending messages particularly to the pituitary gland. This is the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that we'll be talking more about in class. We're talking about the way in which messages are sent to the adrenal medulla and adrenal cortex, which sit just above the kidneys, which release epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol, so variations of adrenaline and cortisol. We'll also talk about the process by which a person typically responds to threats in their environment when they've gone through trauma. So we'll talk about what, how threat detection by the amygdala often leads to this implicit memories being invoked by the, at the hippocampal level. And then the rapid activation of the amygdala leads to this release of hormones uh, th via the uh, hypothalamus pituitary gland and then the adrenal medulla and cortex and those uh, hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, lead to this less uh, ability, lesser ability for a person to think before acting. So it bypasses the prefrontal cortex. And then eventually the person returns to homeostasis, but it can take a while. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is that a person does not return to baseline quickly after they've been activated. We'll talk about some of the resulting physiological reactions of a person who has been activated, such as accelerated heart rate, increased pulse and blood pressure, increased breathing rate, stimulated glucose released by the liver, dilated pupils, and inhibited gut and intestinal functioning. And of course, the latter, uh, uh, the gut and intestinal functioning, is interesting in relationship to what we learned about last week in terms of the um, microbiota gut-brain axis. Allostasis and allostatic load is important for us to learn about because if a person is under undue stress, it causes these adaptations that can be very problematic. And so we'll talk about what happens when they're the, basically the body and brain is out of balance. For example, we'll look at the difference between a regulated nervous system and a dysregulated nervous system, and we'll look at what happens with the vagus nerve and autonomic arousal that becomes dysfunctional. So we'll look at, for example, what happens with freeze responses, what happens with extreme uh, fight or flight, often called approach avoid responses. Then we'll uh, spend a little bit more time with Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory. I want you to have a, a solid understanding of the ventral vagal complex of the social engagement system and what's happening when you're able to join with someone relationally. 
We'll also look at what happens when the sympathetic nervous system is activated and the hyper arousal that can often lead to uh, uh, other interpersonal effects such as perceiving eye contact as threat. We'll also look at hypo arousal, that's the freeze response, and the dorsal vagal response and how that can play out in the counseling room. Now cortisol, of course, is important for us to spend a little bit of time on if we're going to really learn about trauma. We'll learn about the typical trajectory of cortisol production, which is a steady increase from middle childhood to early adulthood, and then leveling off from adulthood onward and learn what happens in trauma. And it's interesting because in trauma, you tend to see, believe it or not, this asymmetrical response. And we'll talk about what that means and, and, and how that plays into a person's symptomology. There's a very important longitudinal study that we'll look at by Trickett to understand that. We'll then turn our attention to the neuroscience of trauma and what's happening in the brain. To do this, we really do have to understand the frontal lobes of the cortex, their, uh, the way in which they work, and what happens when they're damaged or, or impaired. So we'll learn about the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, we'll learn about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and other areas of the prefrontal cortex that are really important for you to, to kind of grasp. Then we'll learn about the role of the anterior cingulate cortex, cortex sorry and we'll learn about the role of the insula. Uh, we'll also talk about Broca's area and what happens in trauma regarding language production. We'll conclude the, this week's content by learning about three approaches to trauma treatment. We won't be able to spend as much time on this as I would like, and we'll explore some of these concepts in more detail uh, when we learn about neuroscience-informed counseling towards the back end of this course. But I at least wanted to introduce them since you're learning about trauma this week. So you'll learn about the three paradigms, which is the behavioral, cognitive, and neurophysiological paradigm. The behavioral paradigm is all about exposure to fear-based stimuli, which builds capacity through positive reinforcement. The cognitive paradigm is the restructuring of cognitions and negative self-appraisal, sometimes this is called uh, uh, self-compassion. Then the neurophysiological paradigm is about the experiencing um, and then the acceptance of the experiencing. So we'll be touching on those, uh, talking a little bit about them, at least introducing them. And that'll wrap up our learning about the neurophysiology of traumatic stress. And we'll discuss much more in class.